Well, it's my uh, privilege to introduce Henry Pohl today. Uh, Henry has been a long-time uh, colleague of mine, working in the early days of Apollo and shuttle. Uh, he's an old country boy, uh, but he has been uh, more, he has created more innovative designs on technical problems than anybody I know. And you might, try, we'll try to bring some of those out because he's really created some very innovative solutions to technical problems. Now, I'm going to set Henry up a little bit, so let me set the stage for you a little bit. I was, um, I was manager of the Space Shuttle Arbiter, and uh, the, the people, the engineers came to me and said, Aaron, the waste management system on the shuttle is not working very well. Now, the waste management system, in simple terms, is the toilet. They said, the toilet's not working very well, and we really need to go off and design a new toilet. So, you know, I thought for a moment, I said, well, yeah, that's probably a pretty important thing to do. Uh, so we did. Well, it turns out the original contract, and I'm quoting a little bit from memory, was about $10 million. Now, $10 million for a toilet, when you go down to any place and get a toilet for a couple of hundred dollars, is a pretty high number. But that wasn't the worst of it. The worst of it, about six months later, they came to me and said, Aaron, guess what? It's not $10 million, it's $20 million. So Congress got wind of this. Uh, Congress got wind of this, and they wanted me to come up and testify. And you can see what kind of fun they're going to have. Uh, waste, waste management, you know, they're going to really have fun with this subject. And you may know some people in Congress, but the name was uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner from Wisconsin. I remember very clearly, he's still in Congress now. He was head of the Science Committee, and that's who we had to go testify for. Well, there was a reporter. There was a reporter for the Washington Post. Her name was Kathy Sawyer. Now, Kathy was the science reporter for the Washington Post. Very, very good. Kathy was very smart, very fair, but she really bore in on things. So um, Kathy got wind of this, so, uh, and uh, she wanted to publish an article on it. So she called me, and she said, uh, would you please talk to me about the waste management system? I said, boy, she's, got, she's, gonna really, she's gonna get me in trouble. So I said, I tell you what, I've got somebody that can really tell you about the waste management system, and I'll have Henry Pohl call you. So I talked to Henry about it. Now that's going to be Henry's introduction to this class of what he told Kathy Sawyer, because it's a classic. Henry, it's all yours. <laughs> Want to use this one? Okay, if you take that out. Can you take it off up here? I can see it. Yeah, maybe something loose. Now you want to turn turn this one on or it's on or it's on. It's on. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Okay, is it working now? Yep. Okay. Darren almost uh, forgot about uh, Kathy, sorry. <clears throat> but for the for Okay. Uh, <laughs> Kathy called me up <clears throat> and uh, said, can you explain to me how I might explain to my neighbor's 14-year-old daughter why NASA has spent $10 million building a toilet? <clears throat> Pardon me. And I said, I'll try. And I thought for a little bit, now, how am I going to start out on this? I said, you know, if you take the commode that you've got in your bathroom and you bolt it upside down in the ceiling, now try using it. <laughs> I said, that's really a little better situation than we have on the orbiter because at least we know which way the gravity field is on that. In orbiter, you don't know. Most of the time you don't have any, but it might be to the right or left or up or down. You know, that was the only reporter that I ever talked to that put everything down verbatim of what I said, the question she asked, and what I said and printed that article in, in the uh, newspaper. 
but uh, that uh, kind of sets a stage for operating in the absence of gravity. You know, I explained to her that the uh, Apollo, I mean the uh, space shuttle volume that the people have to live in is about the same volume as you have in a modern bathroom. You know, if you look at the uh, at the uh, bathroom with a shower and the, and the room out just outside out with a sink and everything, we have just about that same volume in the uh, in the shuttle. Now you seal that all up. You got a certain amount of air that you can use in there, and you only have the air to uh, replace gravity. You've got to have a flow of air to direct whatever you want to direct in a certain certain direction. So you use that air. You run it through. You've got to deodorize it. You've got to clean it. You've got to uh, uh, run it back into the cabin almost instantly. Otherwise, you pull a vacuum in the, uh, in the cabin. And so whenever you start putting all of that equipment in there and all of that stuff in there on something that has never, never been done before, $10 million or $20 million is kind of cheap. When you get right down to it, you look at the number of people that that'll hire for a year working on it is cheap, but to try to get that message across is not easy. <clears throat> Go ahead and, and, and give me my first slide. Uh, uh, let, let me just tell you, tell, tell you another one since Aaron got me off on a tangent here. <clears throat> Chicago Tribune called me one day when we had a problem on, on uh, shuttle. And she was bad mouthing shuttle. And all she wanted to do was get a comment out of me that I agreed with something that she said so she could quote it. And I said, I don't agree with you. I said, you know that Arbiter is really a pretty good vehicle when you look at what it has to do. I said, you realize when it's in orbit, it's going eight times faster than a bullet when it leaves a muzzle of a 30 alt 6 silence on the other end. What's a 30 alt 6 well, I knew that wasn't a good example. <laughs> but I told her, I said, that's, a, that's a, a rifle, a military rifle that's used in the Second World War. And I used to fire that thing in the desert, and I could pull a trigger and see that bullet hit the ground out there 300 yards almost instantly. Now, that shuttle's going eight times faster than that. And I could see the headlines in the Chicago Tribune. The shuttle flies eight times faster than a bullet. Long silence. She said, you know, maybe I ought to find something else to write about. I said, why? She says, I don't think I have a story here. Well, it wasn't a story because it wasn't negative. So, Kathy Sawyer was the only time I ever got a, got a good uh, story from the, from the press. Uh, I want you all to feel free to ask questions. I'm here more to uh, to talk about what you're interested in talking about than than uh, than my thoughts. Uh, so feel free to ask questions anytime. I would like to talk about a half an hour, so somebody's going to have to tell me when half an hour is up, and then I'd like to have some time for some uh, some questions. Uh, my first involvement in the in the space shuttle was for Shay. Max Fouché kind of came up with this idea of a winged vehicle going into space. And we kicked it around for a while, and, and he formed a little committee, very small, about 20 people, as I recall, put the people in a room. He wanted to keep it quiet. He wanted to keep it secret until he got enough data so that he could know whether it's feasible or not. Well, they wanted me to send the best engineer I had over there, and he appointed a guy by the name of Jim Chamberlain to head up that uh, group. So I sent a guy over there. They closed the doors, had a guard in front of the door so nobody could come in, no information could get out. Uh, <clears throat> on the third day, Jim Chamberlain called me up and said, I need to have a talk with my engineer. I said, why? He said, he balked. I said, what do you mean he balked? He says, Henry, you know what no mule do does when they balk, don't you? I said, yeah, they won't go. He said, well, that's you, Mr. Kendrick. He won't go. So I called up uh, my engineer, and I uh, said, what's going on over there, Daryl? He says, oh, they don't know what they want. He said, they gave me some requirements. I designed an RCS system for it. They gave me another set of requirements. I designed another RCS system. 
they gave me some more different requirements. I designed them a different RCS system, and then they came out with another set of requirements. I'm just going to wait until they decide what they want, and then I'll design them an RCS system for it. Well, what, what he didn't understand was that's the way you go about setting the requirements. You get a small group of people together, you set down a set of requirements, you try to put a vehicle together, and see where it punches out. Usually weight, CG, uh, something. So you change the requirements up a little bit and you design another system. You do that very quick and you look at where that one punches out. And then you change the requirements again and you look at those requirements and where it punched out, the first requirements where it punched out, you change the requirements a little bit and see where it uh, punches out. So very, very quickly you run through very, very many configurations. That got the shuttle started. After it got started, we kept changing the requirements uh, as, as we went through the program. Uh, <clears throat> I would uh, uh, suggest that, that you understand your requirements very, very clearly and the impact of your requirements very clearly. You know, things like fail-op, fail-safe, or fail-safe, fail-safe, fail-op are very, very good buzz words. But unless you really understand the impact of those, they can actually make a system less safe. I can make a very good case, and go ahead to the next slide. I can make a very good say, uh, case that a two-engine airplane is safer than a four-engine air, aircraft plane simply by the way that you set your requirements. You know, FAA has a requirement that an airplane has to take off with one engine out. If you've got a two-engine airplane, then most of the time you've got 100% more power than you need. If you've got a four-engine airplane, you only got 25% more power than you need. Most airplane crashes are caused from lack of power at the right time. You know, if you, you've got the power when you need it, then you can, can get out of most, uh, most bad situations. <clears throat> Our original requirements on the shuttle, after we got that s started, was to <clears throat> keep the operations cost low. We wanted to keep the maintenance cost and the operations c cost low. We initially were looking at oxygen-hydrogen systems uh, in fact, uh, the uh, early, all of the early orbiters had, had the hydrogen oxygen on board in place of the payload. We had hydrogen tanks and oxygen tanks in there and carried the, carried the uh, hydrogen oxygen on board. And we actually looked at using the hydrogen out of those tanks. You get it free to power the ohms and the RCS. And we looked at all kinds of ways of getting the pressure up high enough to be able to use the uh, residuals to uh, to power the vehicle. One of the yeah. students asked a question the other day and didn't give her a very good answer. I think it was a that we did at one time look at putting the hydrogen in the in the payload bay of the of the shuttle. That was one of the all all of the very early configurations of the shuttle had the hydrogen and the oxygen in in the shuttle in place of payload bay. That was the very early configurations. Uh, later on, as DOD got involved and other people wanted big spaces and carrying uh, Greyhound buses up there and things like that, we had to use that space, and that's when we came up with the uh, external tank, and that's when we came up with a side-by-side -side, uh, configuration on it. That's the way I recall it. Uh, <clears throat> but we look, looked at oxygen and hydrogen. Then uh, we went to uh, uh, methane. Uh, because we were looking at uh, bulk density so that we had uh, smaller tanks and smaller volumes. Then we looked at oxygen and alcohol, and I really thought we had a good good system with oxygen and al alcohol. I had a lot of confidence in that system. We w used it on Redstone. I had my first job was working on Redstone. I really liked alcohol. I thought we had developed a good ignition system for the RCS so we didn't have to worry about the thousands of so uh, the starts, but obviously that was going to cost us money and cost us a lot of development money. And as time went on, we changed from <clears throat> having low operational cost to low development cost. 
and when we went to low development cost, then we went to bipropellant on the ohms and initially to monopropellant on the RCS. And you go ahead and give me the uh, next uh, slide. Uh, <clears throat> bipropellant, uh, I say bipropellant, what I mean is storables, uh, monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide, both are, are storable uh, propellants. It's self <coughs> self igniting, so you don't have to have a ignition system for it. That simplifies the design a whole lot. Uh, we had a lot of experience with those propellants on uh, Titan II, on Agena, and on Apollo. All of the Apollo uh, stages used uh, uh, either Arizine 50 and, and uh, nitrogen tetroxide or monomethyl hydrogen nitro. So we went to that. On the RCS, we initially went to uh, hydrazine as a monopropellant because it was the simplest system, the cheapest system, but very quickly the weight got out of hand and we had to go to something that had a little bit more performance than hydrazine because all of that weight was in the back end of the vehicle and the back end of the vehicle was getting too, uh, too heavy. Uh, <clears throat> If you, if you only remember two things out of this program, out, out of this uh, exercise, and what I have to say today, the two things I want you to remember is that it is just not natural to think in terms of the absence of gravity, and it is not natural to think about, t think in terms of the absence of pressure. You know, when you, when you think about it, you, you live in it around here on the, on the ground, it's so natural that it's hard to think in terms of designing systems and the impact that the absence of gravity has or the absence of pressure has on the, on the design of the systems. The other thing I would like for you to remember is that there is no substitute for a good, well thought out test program. Uh, let me give you the ohms as, a, as an example. You can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, we did not have a vibration test program on the propulsion systems on the ohms or the RCS in the program because by that time we had good structural programs we could analyze the effect of uh, vibration and stress on the vehicle but we had a good propulsion test program and, and we built a, uh, an ohms pod just like the ones we're going to fly on a vehicle for qualification and when we got through with all the propulsion tests on it and we went through that program in a breeze we had no, uh, no problems at all with it so we finished it early we took that pod down to JSC we put it in our vibroacoustic facility and while we were running the QVVT the, the low level vibration test on that pod just to get the response of how things responded to everything, the helium bottle fell out. Five minutes after that helium bottle fell out, every structural guy in the world could tell you it should have fell out. It would fall out. But nobody thought about it in advance. What happened, we had taken high pressure line, helium line coming out of the bottom of the tank and going five feet or eight feet over to the structure and bolting it to the structure over there. Now that thing was, when you started shaking it, that was acting as a, as a torquing element on that tank and torquing that tank this way. And the struts that they had coming down holding the tank, it was fatiguing where they were put onto the tank. It, it fatigued them right in there and, 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 and broke them off very quick. But we didn't pick it up. <clears throat> uh, the ohms was very, very straightforward from a development standpoint. We came out with a platelet, platelet injector that gave us very good combustion, very close to the... Okay. Uh, platelet in, in, injector is one where we used uh, photographic uh, techniques to uh, etch holes in the, uh, in the injector. You could get a very, very fine pattern. You, could, you, you made it in very thin sheets and you coated the sheet with a a coating where you could put them in a press and heat them and glue them together. So you came up with an injector design that was made out of many, many thousands of 
of very small, uh, very thin plates that set up the uh, uh, manifolding on it. Normal injectors, you know, you, you drill out a manifold in the back and then you take the face plate, plate and you have to drill holes in it. And the problem we get into when you start doing that is with these very small drills, they tend to warp a walk or bend and you don't get a straight hole, you don't get a good spray pattern. With a platelet injector, we could get a very close uh, 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 match. We could just kind of dribble a fuel in there and oxidizer in there where it always matched real, real good. We got very high performance out of it. So that they know what we're talking We're talking about oh, okay. the injector up here where you have the fuel and oxidizer. Fuel and oxygen, and, and then you have to have a whole bunch of, of holes in a pattern such that the fuel and the oxidizer are properly mixed when they ignite you, inside. You, you, you need to get the, uh, get the uh, oxidizer to impinge on the fuel very precisely so that with, a, with an earth storable propellant, a hypergolic uh, propellant as we call it, uh, that's self-igniting. And basically what you have is when, when the two fuels to come together, it's like having a very strong acid and a very strong base coming together. The first reaction that you get is a heating reaction. That chemical reaction that you get will take the propellant temperature up to 800, 1,000, 1,200 degrees. Anyway, it gets it up to the combustion temperature and then, then you start the combustion process. So you don't have to use any other ignition source. All you do is bring those two propellants together and you get that chemical reaction that provides the energy, the heat, to, to heat the propellant to the combustion temperature. We had a, had a uh, like all high performance rocket engines, we had a stability problem with the ohms. And we had to put the big acoustic cavities all the way, 38% of the uh, injector on the uh, ohms was cavities designed and sized to damp out the uh, uh, stability. So we had a very good stable engine. The RCS on the other hand is a totally different design. <clears throat> now, we put the uh, propellant tanks on the RCS up in front of the Ohm's tanks so that we, for aerodynamic purposes. That gave us a 30-foot uh, propellant line down to the RCS. Then we manifold three, four, five engines on the end of that uh, pipe that's pulsing in and out of phase or steady state. Uh, some of them are running <clears throat> at 40 milliseconds or 80 millisecond pulses. Some of them might be running at four times that on a pulse width, and some of them might be running at state of state. Anyway, the, the dynamics, the pressure in that line that the engine sees varies somewhere between vapor pressure and about 1,000 psi. And since one propellant is 1.6 times the density of the other propellant, when that valve opens down there, that pressure wave's got to go back up to the tank and come back down to the uh, injector before you uh, uh, get, get any, basically any flow, flow out of it. Just the compressibility that you have in the pipe will come, come out. So the pressure essentially drops to vapor pressure. Now we use helium to pressurize those tanks. Well, when you use helium to pressurize those tanks, the helium is dissolved in the propellant. When it gets down to the engine, it uh, comes out of solution, so the engine has to be able to stay together at any mixture ratio <coughs> uh, and almost any, any pressure. And you're looking at hundreds of thousands of starts over the life of one of those uh, programs on one of those engines. And we talk about pulse width. Pulse width is the on time, the minimum on time that you can have on a rocket engine. Now there's a volume between the face of the valve and the face of the injector that we call dribble volume. That volume, the larger that volume is, the larger the pulse width you need on it. You would like to have the seat of the injector to be the face of the, I mean the seat of the valve to be the face of the injector so you had zero dribble volume in there. That way you'd get closer to a square, square wave, wave pulse. And your friends in guidance, control, <clears throat> they always want a square wave pulse and they want it of an infinite thrust level 
and zero width so that you put an instantaneous pulse. It makes it easy for them to calculate where the vehicle's going to go. Then if you get one that builds up kind of slow and goes down kind of slow. <coughs> so uh, the, the dribble volume, the volume that you have between the valve seat and the, uh, and the injector face when the engine shuts down, when the valve closes, that flow stops, and that amount of propellant stays in there. Now, in a vacuum, when it gets down to the vapor pressure, it starts boiling out and goes out through the chamber. And you have a refrigeration effect from, from that uh, uh, boiling of the uh, propellant. If the pulse width is too short, then the refrigeration effect will overcome the heating effect from that short pulse, and you keep reducing the temperature of the uh, hardware. Now, the colder the propellant gets, the more heat that you have to put in it in the chemical reaction when it first comes together to get it to ignite. So you get an ignition delay in the thing, and then you start getting into hard starts if it gets too cold. So we set our pulse width on the uh, uh, shuttle at 40 milliseconds. That was the neutral point at which the uh, refrigeration effect equaled the heating effect from the, uh, from the pulse. And so you'd maintain the temperature. We later on went to uh, 80 milliseconds on it because we added the uh, verniers. That gave us a little bit uh, heat input. Now it's pretty uh, pretty tough design in itself. Uh, the valve that we used for a thousand pound rocket on the uh, uh, Arbiter weighed less than the valves that we used on the Apollo program for a hundred pound thruster. And what we did, we went to a, a pilot operated valve, <coughs> and that was kind of my uh, my concept that I borrowed from Sears and Roebuck. Uh, <coughs> If you ever take a washing machine apart on a Sears Roebuck and you look at how the valve is designed, it's a pilot operator valve. And they use the water pressure to open the valve. Well, I thought that was a good way to go. You put a very small coil in there, and quick acting coil, and, and replace that rubber uh, uh, bellers that they used on a Sears Ro Roebuck washing machine with a stainless steel diaphragm, and you got it made. Well, unfortunately, the water pressure in a house doesn't vary as much as the uh, water hammer does on the, uh, on the uh, uh, space shuttle. So before we got through with the design of that valve, it got to be a very complex valve, and uh, it was a very expensive valve, but it works. Uh, let me... Uh, Probably the other thing that we ought to say about designing any, any system that's going to work with these hypergolic fuels, I mean, they, they just eat away at things like O-ring seals, and I mean, it's just nasty uh, stuff, and, and uh, so you've got lots of, in well, addition to the mechanical problems that, that Henry, Henry was talking about, you've got all the materials problems, which we, just, just we, makes your life harder. We really wanted to stay away from, uh, from hypergols, from the acid, from the very strong acids and the very strong bases for the simple reason that there's very few materials that's compatible with them. Matter of fact, the main reason we went to an I mean, to a hydrazine RCS in the beginning was to avoid having an expulsion system in the uh, oxidizer because we had no material available that you could put in there as a diaphragm to push the propellants out that was com compatible with N204 that you could make cycles with. We could use bellers, metal bellers, but they weren't very reliable. They were extremely heavy, and so we had to come up with a better system with, than that. And then, then we kind of got to looking into putting in screens in the system, and that was really a hard sell. I mean, I, I spent lots of time with Aaron. I was, I was convinced that system would work, because if you look at an automobile gas tank, every fuel tank on every automobile has got a sock in it. That sock is about an inch, inch and a half in diameter, and it will suck every drop of fuel out of that gas tank. They put it in a little sump in there, and it will, will just 
draw that tank dry before it'll break down and, and let air go, go through it. So I was convinced that we could build one of those systems and make it work. But you look at an automobile, you know, it goes over rough roads, it bounces, you've got G fields, you've got all kinds of forces on that thing, and yet it works very good. The problem we had in trying to sell that concept to the program, though, was how do you prove it? The only technique we had to prove it was through analysis. And you're trying to prove that something like that will work purely from analysis and qualified by analysis was a hard, hard sell. We later on in the program came up with techniques that where we could wrap tape around most of the screens in there so that we close up most of the area and so we draw propellant in, in in very small areas with it where the air space is on top and prove that uh, you could get down to a certain delta P and across it before it would break down to qualify our analysis. We still wasn't satisfied with that so we made up a system with a glass tank we put it on our uh, vomit comet and uh, flew it and, and that was the only time I ever rode that thing. If we'd made one more time, it would have been been all over for me. But <laughs> but uh, you get up 38,000 feet and you make a dive on that thing and, and you can maintain zero G in it through, through that 30 second or 38 second period of time. And by expelling the right amount and handing the right levels, we could prove that it uh, it would work, and it has worked very, very good on all, all of the flights. Put your uh, pistol ball, lifted your pistol ball. In the future, uh, design of spacecraft, what is going to be the difference in the uh, uh, RCS system? Because every, every system is going to have to have some kind of reaction control system. What do you think they're going to go with in the future system? I I really believe that, uh, that we ought to go with uh, either methane and LOX or alcohol and LOX. I think it's a much cleaner system. You know, we developed that little piezoelectric uh, igniter for the uh, for the shuttle program. We never used it after we went away from those systems. But you, you buy these little batch torches now that you push a button and pull a trigger on it, and and they light off most of the time. Although last one I got, uh, that's all right, just leave it off. Uh, last one I got didn't light too good, but. But we have good, reliable ignition systems now, and I think that you can design a system now that has uh, uh, the reliability that you need for a space system. Otherwise, you know, we've done nothing in this country since uh, since the shuttle program on developing. Pulse width is very important, too, and uh, uh, that gives the right... You, the things you got to remember is that... Uh, that uh, you, you, you you got to you you got to remember the thermal characteristics is very very different in a vacuum than it is. It's very than it is on Earth. It is very different in the absence of gravity. You wouldn't think gravity would make any difference in it, but it it does. You got some fluid in the tank. You know you put some heat on the bottom of the tank. Where does heat go? It goes top of the tank. Top of the tank is always the hottest part when you got a liquid. In 1G, you put it in 0G, you put heat on the bottom of the tank, a bubble forms down there, pushes the liquid away from it, and nothing comes out of the tank. Let me have some questions. <coughs> I'm slightly confused on the fuel that the systems uses. Both, both the RCS and the homes use hydrazine or hyperdolic or what is it? Well, I'm confused on what. Okay, hydrazine is into H4. We use that as a monopropellant. A bipropellant, uh, uh, earth storable. Explain what monopropellant system, you normally run it over a catalytic bed. A, right? a monopropellant decomposes. system, yes. And a monopropellant, there's two, two monopropellants out there that work very good. One is uh, peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, and if you can get it above 90%, it, it gets a little more stable, and the other one is hydrazine. Both of those you run through a, a, a cat bed, a catalyst. When it hits a catalyst, you get the uh, reaction out of it, and it breaks down. Uh, uh, hydrogen uh, peroxide breaks down to uh, steam and, and hydrogen, uh, or oxygen, and, uh, and hydrazine breaks down to hydrogen and uh, uh, ammonia, NH3. 
but both of those give you hot gases then uh, for, for propulsion. You mix that with an acid and you get combustion. And uh, we used Arizene 50, I mentioned that. Arizene 50 was 50% uh, hydrazine and 50% unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine. Monomethyl hydrazine is just just that. It's, it's monomethyl hydrazine. It's a lot more stable than is uh, hydrazine. Uh, it has a, a wider freezing boiling point than hydrazine. Hydrazine has a lot of the characteristics of water as far as density, uh, freezing, and boiling. It'll, boil, it'll freeze at about the same uh, temperature as water. It'll boil at about the same temperature as water. And it has almost the same density as water. Monomethyl hydrazine has a little bit slightly less density, uh, gives you slightly better performance, uh, but it freezes at like minus 63 degrees or something like that. Monomethyl hydrazine and uh, nitrogen tetroxide. Same thing for the ohms. Now, <clears throat> one of the things we do is we put about four, four tenths of a percent of uh, nitri nitric oxide in the nitrogen tetroxide to keep the tanks from breaking. We have uh, titanium tanks and on the Apollo program we got in a very serious problem because our tank started exploding. Turned out with, with uh, Arizene 50 or monopropellant hydrazine we had a little bit of water in there and that gave off a little bit of free hydrogen and that free hydrogen, titanium just does not like hydrogen. Henry, is this where the fractional yeah. mechanics really started? Yes. How many people take fractional mechanics? <coughs> well, fractional mechanics really started from that. That's when we started working with uh, a gentleman called Dr. Tiffany at, uh, at uh, Boeing. We worked, so, uh, we worked with the whole world on, on that right, problem. Fractional mechanics. That's how fractional mechanics really got started. You had a, uh, you were going to ask something. Uh, I, let me, let me, yeah. and, and other, while we're talking about fractures, one of the other problems of dealing with these hypergolic fuels is, is the freezing problem. Maybe we talk a little bit about that because when, uh, unlike water, when the, when the hydrazine freezes, it, it shrinks. And, and so if you imagine that you've got hydrazine liquid in a, in a line under pressure, and now it gets too cold, so it freezes, and now that leaves a little bit of, of free volume, so you get more liquid that comes in there, and that will freeze until finally the entire line is clogged up with, with solid hydrazine. Now, when it warms up, it expands, and you crack the line, and now you've got a, a hypergolic leak, which is really bad news. So, in fact, maintaining thermal control of the ohms and RCS propellant lines becomes a very critical issue and there's there's heating coils all over the place and and thermostats and and so you know again you 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 don't just have a propulsion system you in the the systems engineering that we've talked about it it affect it 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 affects the thermal uh, the electrical system uh, because if you know all these things are are uh, interrelated, if you lose an electrical system so that you can't run the heaters, then you run the risk of losing your propellant system, and so then you have to have redundant heaters and so on, and it gets more and more complicated. <coughs> that 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 was a major major problem we had on Apollo 13. We didn't have enough power. We had to turn everything off quick and try to get those people to, to uh, let the temperature go down out of limits was not easy. And, and I remember sitting down and spending the entire night running out the thermal ca calculations and back calculating out when we could turn the heaters off or we could kick the uh, service module off of that vehicle and not freeze the propellant in the RCS on the command module. And then I got really, really worried. I gave myself four degrees above freezing on that system, and I missed it two degrees. It got two degrees colder than uh, we had uh, had planned. I think, I think you have to say, in summary for the students, that uh, the design of the RCS system is, was very, very complicated. Uh, and uh, how many how many RCS thrusters do we have? Forty? How many thrusters do we have on the shuttle? Uh, Thirty-eight. Uh, what is thirty-eight? Uh, uh, Thirty-eight primary and four vernier. Yeah. And so it's a very complicated system in designing it. And it, it, it had a lot of requirements placed on it. On the other hand, the Ohm's engine, as I recall, we have never had a, a failure on the Ohm's engine. 
The Holmes engine has been been very, very successful. It's a very straightforward uh, program. Uh, by getting the, uh, the uh, combustion close to the injector on the ohms, then we could make the chamber small on the ohms. And by making the chamber very small on the ohms, then you could fuel cool, cool it. You could put cooling channels down the uh, chamber, run the fuel down there, and keep the chamber cool so it wouldn't burn out. Now, we also did the same thing on the RCS, a little bit uh, different. You know, the, uh, the RCS is a buried ins installation. You run that engine for 500 uh, seconds or more, as we have to run if we want to use it for deorbit, in case the ohms plays out sometimes. That engine has to stay together on these very, very short burns. It also has to stay together on these very, very long burns with fluctuating inlet pressures and fluctuating mi mixture ratios. We found <coughs> that if we make a very, very short chamber, and that's for why when you look at the RCS, it's a big chamber, it's very short. We could put enough fuel down the walls of that chamber to effectively cool the chamber so that it only go up steady states to a certain safe temperature and still have good uh, good performance out of it. So we put uh, we put a lot of fuel down the uh, down the walls on it. Looking in this direction, if this is the injector plate, the the holes around the out the outermost layer, those are all fuel. So yes. you basically get a, a fuel bath coming along that actually comes in contact. And fuel, if you have a fuel rich mixture, same as in a car, the fuel rich mixture burns cooler. The thing that you're really afraid of, in fact you have to deal with a lot of contingencies on this system. You know, what happens if you get a, uh, a, a clog in, in one of your, uh, your feed lines? The, the worst situation you can get in is that you, you get a, a clog in your fuel inlet line, and, and that gives you an oxidizer-rich mixture which burns hot, and you can then actually call it, get a melt through, and and so you got to you got to shut shut your engine down in a hurry if that happens. Yeah, th these are very very small orifices, and a lot of them around the outside of it, and and if you get get a couple of these orifices plugged, then that becomes a hot spot on the uh, side of the uh, chamber. And we use uh, columbium, which has very poor heat transfer. We used uh, uh, molybdenum on uh, Apollo, which has good heat transfer, but return to your, uh, your point about the possibility of using the RCS as a backup for yes. re-entry. Uh, uh, what prevents one from using a series of relatively short birds, counting upon the mass of the, of the orbiter to smooth out the uh, velocity change? Why do you have to have a single 500 second bird with all the heating that's associated with it? It's, it's just a matter of, of uh, before you start to burn, you know, to come back in, how much time you can put in between those and how short. A thousand pound thruster for deorbit takes a fairly long burn. And the engine goes to steady state fairly quick, you know, in, in, a, in a matter of 20 seconds. If you make a 20 second RCS engine, it is essentially at the steady state. So you can just continue that out. We ran RCS engines for the uh, shuttle up to an hour and a half on a single single bar and just let them run until it takes as large as our propeller tanks were, otherwise we'd run them long. But, uh, but to get enough delta V, you have to put in, even though you put it in in multiple barns, you still have to have fairly long pulse widths on each one of them. And that impacts the yeah, guidance very, very bad. Now let, me, let me help with a little orbital mechanics. We've, we've talked about this before. Yeah, I'm corrupt. I have to borrow this one. Okay. That one's not working. I'm just, I'm just hard, on, uh, <laughs> hard on mics. Probably won't be able to understand you. I've got the tape for very, very bad. So that's the earth. You're in orbit. When you do a burn, you, you do a retrograde burn, which lowers the other side of your orbit, so that now becomes the, the perigee. The thing is, from orbital mechanics, 
the most efficient way to do a burn is to have, like Henry said, an infinite thrust in the, with a zero pulse width. So you do what they call an impulsive burn. But in the real world, that never happens. Now, you know, it, it's 45 minutes from here to here. It's a 90-minute orbit. Now, when you have two Ohm's engines, uh, typical deorbit burn lasts two to two and a half minutes. So, you know, you're burning over this segment. So, you know, it's pretty close to an impulsive burn. If you lose one Ohm's engine, now you have to double it. So now you're up to a five-minute burn. But the if you lose your second Ohm's engine and now you have to do an RCS deorbit, now you're getting into a 10, 15 second, 15 minute burn, and, and so you're actually really far away from optimum, and the burn gets much less efficient. And so if you're if you have plenty of propellant, yeah, you're fine. But if you're low on propellant, you need to worry about the efficiency of your burn. And so you know if you if you were to do a little bit of a burn and then shut it down to let your engines cool off, and then you try to do it complete the burn around here. Now now it's gotten really, really inefficient. And you might run out of propellant. We spent uh, uh, an enormous amount of time with our uh, orbital mechanics people and our guidance people trying to get the ohms uh, drop down as low as we can get it because the lower you can get it, the smaller the hardware, the lighter the weight of the uh, of the hardware and the performance is essentially the same. Uh, the ISP for a, a 3,000 pound engine is essentially the same as it is for a 20,000 or maybe even a little bit higher for, for a 3,000. So we had 5,000 pound thrust in there. We had 4,000 pound thrust in there. I think we finally wound up with 3,500. Uh, been left up to me, I think we could have done it with a, with a 1,500 pound thrust engine, but uh, we compromised. Quite, yes? Uh, Professor Cohen once mentioned that uh, some people suggested putting some RCS um, thrusters on the, on, the, on, the edge of, on the edge of the wingtips, but that would be very difficult after the uh, design was finalized. All of, all of our early configurations that we had, we had the RCS pods out on the, uh, on the wingtips made the RCS very efficient. We even had a combination of ohms. I mean, our, our RCS was the ohms at one time, and we had it all out on, on wingtips. Didn't make our structures uh, friends too happy at first because that puts a lot of mass out into the wings, and they didn't like it uh, too much. But after they got looking at it, that turned out that really wasn't much of a driver. Uh, it made the RCS very efficient. Uh, the thing that kind of changed that is when we put the payload, the big payload bay on the inside of the vehicle, and then we had to put a big ohms pod on there, and then to put the RCS pods out on a, on a wing tip of a Delta system out there uh, just didn't way out good. It was more efficient from a weight standpoint to put the ohms and RCS together because we actually have those two interconnected, so if we have to do an ohms burn with the RCS, we can take the propellant out of the ohms tank to feed the, uh, feed the RCS. And, and so it just made a more efficient system to, to uh, bring it all in. We had another requirement. When we went to the uh, uh, acid-based propellants, we had a requirement that we had to have removable pods. You had to be able to take a pod, the propulsion system, off of the orbiter and take it over to another facility to rework it because we knew we were going to have a lot of uh, work and rework on those systems, at least early on. Uh, now, the, let's see, you, you had a question right here. Yeah, to what extent can you change orbits to a higher or lower orbit for different part of the mission? Or uh, that's very, uh, very limited, but yeah, uh, we do have the capability to go up and down in orbit, uh, I don't know, maybe 50 miles. I, yeah, it, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't have a good, a good answer, I don't remember that, that's been too long ago. It, with a, with but, a full, uh, with a full load, you have, uh, you have a few hundred feet per second uh, I'd, I'd have to go and look up. You can't make a plane change. No, you, plane changes are, are, are out. But we, we certainly have, uh, have gone from 
uh, let's see, like 180 nautical mile orbits down to 105 mile. I, I remember one flight where we did that. Uh, to, to, go, to go up, um, you know, after, what you really want to do is, of course, use your main propulsion system to get into the, the right orbit that you want to go to. Then if you're going to do a rendezvous, you have to change the height a little bit. But you typically try to get orbit insertion within about 20 nautical miles, so about 40 kilometers of radius of, of your ultimate intended uh, orbit. But for some special uh, missions, like we were, I was on one mission where we were, we were up at about 180 nautical miles doing various operations, but then the last couple of days they wanted to look at the interaction of the orbiter with the atomic oxygen and nitrogen which caused this orbiter glow phenomena, which maybe some of you have heard about. But So we had to go down to uh, about 105 nautical miles, which is about as low as you can go and, and stay in orbit for more than a day or so. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, we, we, that was okay because, you know, that was just, you're doing part of your deorbit burn, but then you stop. What you wouldn't want to do is go to a 105 mile orbit and then go up, and then you have to come all the way down again. I think I'll take one more question. It, okay, it's, it's awful it's easy to, uh, <clears throat> to decrease the orbit because you're using part of the energy that you have to use to come back home anyway. When you start trying to go up is when you're adding, but we have a lot of contingency propellant on board. You know, we got contingency propellant in case the main engine shut off early and you have to use the RCS. If you've got a docking mission, we've got uh, propellant in there for three or four attempts at docking at, and things like that. So there's extra propellant that you can use to give you a little bit uh, boost. You had a question here. It's about the, you know, the block fuel line causing an over temperature and the, uh, and the presenting hazard that way. What kind of uh, feedback the crew has something like that was happening? Are there sensors in that? system that I don't hear too good so yeah. I, I, there's the, the question is what sort of sensors do we have for the operation of the engine so and, and, and I, I mean I can there there's a, there's pressure sensors there's temperature sensors uh, again remember when we were talking earlier though sensors don't always tell the truth sometimes you can get sensor failures and so we we spend a lot of time practicing and you work out all the different scenarios you know this is what you'll see if you have a, a real failure this is what you'll see if you have a sensor failure you try to get before you shut down a a good working engine you'd like to confirm the fact that it's really a, an engine problem not a sensor problem on the other hand you don't want to take a chance that you're going to get a a uh, into a, a uh, oxidizer rich situation and blow up your engine so you you you, you practice and after a while you get pretty good at diagnosing the problems fairly quickly uh, the computer doesn't normally shut down the ohms engine on its on its own the computer won't shut down any of the propulsion systems on its own. Well, it so, shut down the main propulsion. The main engine, yeah, yeah. But, but, but none of these will it shut down on its own. If somebody's got to take some, uh, some action to, uh, to shut it down. We get an awful lot of uh, data on the ground, too, that, uh, that you don't have in the, in the cockpit that you can look at different instruments and, and uh, back up things and try to understand uh, whether it's a sensor failure or a... Okay. Uh, Any other questions on ohms and RCS? What, uh, during entry, when you're coming down using the RCS before, for like uh, trajectory guidance before your aero surfaces are usable, how much propellant would you typically use? Is it like a certain percentage that would be average? Uh, that's a pretty uh, pretty low uh, percentage, and I don't recall. That. That's been a long time now, and I don't recall the numbers. But uh, I would say it's, it's less than 10% of the uh, propellant that we use. What did you say? Yeah, about okay. 10%. That's okay. We, well, at least <laughs> that ought to be a pretty good number. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's not a lot of propellant to come back in uh, uh, on it. Uh, the vehicle is a fairly stable vehicle. Now, on, on Columbia, you know, they, they, I guess they either run out of propellant or just about run out of propellant on it, trying to, trying to hold it 
when uh, it was the RCS was doing all it could to try to hold that vehicle on on course after it started picking up drag on one side. Uh, and there, we actually did have procedures in place uh, for what we called a no RCS entry. If if you had run out of propellant entirely, don't know if it would have worked, but we we you know there were certain. Uh, you, you tried to get it into as stable a, an aerodynamic situation as possible uh, and just hold it there. So, never had to actually do it. I'll Did, take one. Any more Ohm's RCS questions? Otherwise, why don't we take a little break and then we'll come back for APU hydraulics. Two minute break. Okay. Thank you all. Appreciate it. You're not finished. APU and hydraulics, <clears throat> and I guess I need to point out some acronyms. Calling the APU an APU was the biggest mistake we ever made. <laughs> that gave me more grief than any other system that I had to deal with was the acronym. APU stands for Auxiliary Power Unit, and the Aerospace Safety Advisory Committee I tell you, Henry, my, my kids, when I was growing up, used to think it was a three-letter three bad word. I mean, they thought the APU was a bad word. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I got a call, there's something wrong with it. If we would have called it primary power unit, then uh, we would have had a lot less grief in trying to defend it to the outside, outside world. Uh, APU hydraulics, like the uh, ohms and RCS, all of our first activity was directed toward keeping the operational cost down low, keeping the maintenance cost down low, and uh, we looked at those kinds of systems that gave you clean propellants, easy propellants to deal with, and uh, you didn't have to worry about the uh, strong bases and strong acids to, uh, to work with. Uh, Later on, as time went on, we got uh, more into looking at what we could do cheap from a development standpoint and let the uh, operational cost float because it's obvious that uh, <clears throat> the uh, money was not going to be there to put into a big uh, a development program. Uh, The, the control of the vehicle in the atmosphere was a major, major activity to try to find out what you could get by with versus what you would like to, like to have. Now, you know, you try to, try to move these huge barn doors fast and a whole lot. Uh, there's huge forces on those things. It takes lots and lots of power to, uh, to move them and move them quick. And our aero people and our guidance people, they would like to have, like we was talking a while ago, an, an, an inst instantaneous impulse into that vehicle. When it starts to drift a little bit and they want to move it some other way, they like to put an impulse in there and just kick it right back where it's supposed to be instantly. But that becomes impractical when you uh, look at uh, these kind of, kind of systems. Uh, we started out with dual tandem actuators. Now, dual tandem actuators is something that uh, kind of met our uh, fail-op, fail-safe uh, criteria. In other words, you had two pistons in, in one actuator driven by two different hydraulic systems and, and you would, uh, would move them together. Uh, when you start looking at all of the failure modes associated with, with dual tandem actuators, even though it meets the fail-off, fail-safe criteria and it makes the uh, uh, safety people happy and, and, uh, and the people that's looking at uh, the buzzwords, it actually was making the system less safe. Is that because you have uh, 
a single passage you said could dump all the hydraulic fluid? Uh, n n no, that uh, what what happened in a, in a in a dual tandem actuator in order to get them to work good, if you busted an actuator, then that became a big sponge. You didn't have any way to take that uh, space uh, out. So trying to uh, uh, have that actually to work when, when the other half went out made it very, very difficult from a design standpoint to come up with a system that you could lock it in place. And we even had designs for if one, one hydraulic system failed, that that shaft would actually lock itself. With the absence of pressure, it would lock itself. Well, that becomes a failure in itself because if that mechanism fails, then uh, you've got a locked actuator. And the one thing you can't stand on an airplane is for an actuator not to, not to move. We were finally able to convince the uh, people, uh, and Aaron was having lots and lots of problems about that time because all of the weight was in the back end of the vehicle. Those dual tandem actuators were extremely heavy and the back end of the vehicle was getting too heavy. So we actually went to a, a single actuator and we put switching valves in there where we could switch any one of the four APU systems into that uh, uh, actuator. And we had four APUs at that time. <clears throat> Weight was still a problem, so we were able to convince the community that we could live with uh, three APUs and have one APU fail and come home in a normal mode with two, and if you had two failures, you could still land the vehicle with one, with one actuator. You lost a whole bunch of systems, but uh, you could still land it with, uh, with one, one APU. And we almost did that one time because uh, if someone would have told me that we would ever have two failures of the same type on the same flight of the nature that we had, I would have never believed it. But we came home on one flight with two APUs burning. We had a fire in both, in both of the APUs. And the reason for that, after the fact again, is very, very simple. We went through a very good qual program. We did everything that we knew to do on those things only to find out that we had not planned on landing the vehicle in California and piggybacking it back down to the Cape over and over again. What happens when you do that is that you land the vehicle, there's a little bit of residual APU, uh, hydrazine in those tubes between the valves and the, and the injector. You go back up into a vacuum or low pressure all of the air goes out of the system, and then we come and land in Florida. It's always humid in Florida. There's a lot of moisture there, and as that moist air started feeding back in the uh, engine, it went up past the cat bed and got in those uh, tubes between the uh, valve and the injector and set up a, a very, very corrosive environment of uh, uh, residual uh, hydrazine and, uh, and water. And, and they gave off free hydrogen, and you had hydrogen or intergranular corrosion in those tubes. And we had two of them to break on the same flight. But, uh, but it, it, it worked. Uh, we spent an awful lot of time uh, looking at power sources to power the hydraulic systems. And we even looked at going with all electrical systems. You know, the DOD had some uh, very good fuel cells out there that was, had a lot of promise. They put out an awful lot of power at that time. The shuttle fuel cells. You know, let me just digress a little bit and talk about shuttle fuel cells. I don't think anybody can cover that. Uh, you know, on Gemini, fuel cells never did work. We always came back with... Uh, uh, half voltage or partial voltage and, and, and most of the fuel cells out. On Apollo, it only took 14 PhDs and 14 uh, PhDs to uh, start them and shut them down. And then you couldn't start them again. On, on the space shuttle, those fuel cells is just a, a very, very good battery with the root uh, chemical stored external to the to the battery. They would make an outstanding DC welder. 
I mean, you could put electrodes in that thing and, and put an electrical rod in there and strike an arc and weld with them and break the arc, strike an arc and weld and break the arc, and they just, just do it repeated. You can throw a switch, they're on, you throw a switch, they're off, and uh, so they're very, very simple. I really, really wanted us to go with an all-electrical system, using electrical motors to, uh, and power hinges and, and uh, power electric mechanical actuators to, uh, to drive the uh, systems because I was absolutely convinced that one of these days we're going to have a leak in the hydraulic system, and when we have a leak in the hydraulic system, we're going to have a fire. It's very difficult to know your car. It's very difficult to keep. Uh, you, you always have hydraulic. All airplanes have hydraulic leaks. Now you don't have to worry too much about hydraulic leaks on, on an airplane because you sell them every in, in enough pressure where you sell them ever have to worry about a fire. We went to from from 5606 hydraulic full fluid to 83 282 hydraulic fluid simply because it was advertised as being more flame resistant. Uh, it's really not more flame resistant. The, the, the 83282 uh, hydraulic fluid has a much, much lower vapor pressure than does 5606. And the way that they test it is they've got a Bunsen burner out here. They take a pipe cleaner and dip, dip it in the fluid, clamp it in this device that rotates past that Bunsen burner, and they count the number of times it'll go across it before the fire starts. <laughs> Well, with uh, 5606, it'll usually start on a third burn. With 83282, it takes 10, 11, or 12 passes before it'll ignite and start burning, simply because it has a lower vapor pressure and you cannot burn any liquid in liquid stage. You have to get it warm enough so that it'll, it'll gasify, and then you have to heat it enough in the gas phase to get it up to the combustion temperature or put a spark in it after it's in the gas phase, but it won't ignite as a, as a liquid. Well, with 5606, if you have a leak in the hydraulic system going uphill, you probably don't have to worry about it coming home because it's gone. If it all boils off and it's gone. With 83282, all it does is sink it soak out into the structure and in the insulation and all over the place and then when you come back home if you if it gets in a hot spot and you start heating it up it forms a gas and it's, you're going to get a get an explosion in the back of the vehicle so, you made the wrong decision. so that was that was a bad bad decision there and uh, we went in a bad direction but it gave everybody a warm feeling uh, <laughs> we would have went with electromechanical system <coughs> Uh, but at, by that time, we had a lot of hydraulic people working on the program, and we would lay those people all off, and we had to go hire a whole bunch of electromechanical people, and a lot of people was concerned about the immaturity of those systems, and again, it boiled down to, uh, really the, to uh, development costs. Did we really have the, the energy source that could, could handle that? Oh, I'm convinced that, uh, that we could have put six or eight of those fuel cells that we've got on there right now on there and we could have handled it. Uh, you know, broke it down and 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 and, 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 and the uh, fuel cells that uh, the DOD had under development at that time was very, very good fuel it's cells. Big, big so, today, so maybe if you were doing so, the system. If well, I if I was upgrading the uh, shuttle today, that's one of the things that I absolutely would go to. I would go to a, something to get rid of the hydraulic fluid. Uh, it creates a, a lot of other kinds of problems that you have to deal with. But actually, um, on I mean, before the decision was made that the shuttle was going to be retired in, in five years, NASA was working on upgrades if we were going to fly the shuttle for another 20 or 25 years. And one of the upgrades, which actually got to a... a fairly advanced stage in the design was just what you were saying, yes. was yes. get rid of the AP <coughs> hydraulics, use the latest technology now available for electromechanical actuators. But the problem, I, I, I don't know the details of it, but but the cost just kept going up and up and up, and, and by the time it went up above about $300 million, they just 
said, you know, yeah. we can't afford to do this. And yeah, the, the, the problem we always had in trying to upgrade the uh, uh, propulsion, you know, we could have went to an alcohol uh, lock space uh, uh, RCS gnomes on it. We could have upgraded to an electromechanical system, but it seemed to me like that the uh, uh, displays and, and, and those kinds of upgrades took a lot of computers. Uh, you know, that those the systems took a lot of priority in, in where the monies went in trying to upgrade the, uh, the Arbiter. Uh, go ahead and throw the next slide up there if you can do it real handy. Uh, <clears throat> Oh, wait. Uh, we did go from four to three systems. Wait a minute. Yeah, wait a minute. You, you already got it up here. I wasn't watching. Uh, we did uh, go from, from four APUs to uh, three APUs and still having the ability to land the vehicle with one, uh, one APU. We looked at hydrogen oxygen APUs. We looked at... Uh, uh, Bipropellant APUs. We looked at uh, uh, monopropellant APUs. We looked at uh, pulse modulated versus pressure modulated. If you don't know what I mean by that, pulse modulated is when you have a valve that goes open and closed and you get steady state uh, pressure in your gas generator while it's on. Pressure modulated, you have a, a, a throttle valve where you throttle the flow down going to the uh, uh, gas generator to give you just the power that you need for the uh, for the load that you're trying to pull at the time and that was the easiest system to come up with simply because we didn't know at the time if we could build a valve that was capable of millions and millions of cycles and not not leak but the problem with the pressure modulated system was that most of the time you're operating at very, very low power levels. Just the power just peaks up every once in a while to high power levels. Well, when you're running very low pressures in a gas turbine, the turbine becomes less efficient. Uh, and, and the less efficient the turbine becomes, the more propellant you have to burn and again, the weight goes up. So we uh, kind of bit the bullet on that and went to a pressure uh, modulated system where we vary the uh, own time. And uh, the valve development was very successful. We had very little trouble getting a valve that would work except for contamination. We always had a little contamination. We had a lot of problems down the Cape. With, with the early valves leaking. We finally put, got good filters, put good filters in the system and that, that eliminated <clears throat> that. Uh, we did, yes? Was the uh, reason to go from four to three APUs just a weight issue? It's, it's again a weight issue. Uh, all of that weight was in the back of the vehicle and the back of the vehicle was always too heavy. And every time we could take a pound out of the uh, back of the vehicle, we could take a pound of ballast out of the front of the vehicle. So there's two pounds you didn't have to carry. Just really so it's strictly weight. I'm sorry. Um, the, the APUs are turbines. I mean, you're combusting it somewhere. The, 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 the APUs, what we settled on was going with a monopropellant hydrazine. Okay. Feed that through a catalyst bed and then through a turbine. We looked at dual stage, triple stage turbines. We finally wound up with a single stage turbine running at about uh, 38 to 45,000, I don't remember the exact number now, RPM. Ten inch, but, ten inch diameter. <clears throat> yes, about 10 inches in diameter is a re-entry wheel that the gas went in and then made a pass and went back through. So we got a little, maybe five, 10 percent more power out of it the second time through, a little bit more power out of it the second time through. Uh, when we contracted for the APU, the contractor did not have altitude uh, facilities. And so they proposed that we did not need to test the APU in a vacuum because that was all structure and all they had to do was pull a vacuum on the exhaust and they could get the performance out of that. So we did not have it in our qual program to test the APU in a vacuum. 
fortunately, uh, Dr. Coyne gave us enough uh, money to buy an APU offline of the shuttle program. We brought it down to the JSC. We put it in our vacuum facilities there, and we programmed the vacuum facility to to go down in pressure like the orbit was going up in altitude, and we ran the ascent profile and shut the APU off, just like we would on the first flight, and five minutes after we shut it off, it exploded. It detonated. <laughs> I mean, talking about things coming unglued, everything came unglued. The air came unglued. <laughs> uh, we got another APU, we brought it down there, we brought all of the contractor people down, everybody down there, we repeated the test, it exploded again. By that time, we discovered what the problem was. We have a requirement in the program that you can only have uh, uh, hot surfaces up to about 500 degrees. Or I don't remember the exact temperature, but some temperature like 500 degrees. If it's higher than that, you have to shield it. So the gas generator is obviously running over 500 degrees, probably up around 800, 900 degrees. So we put a heat shield around it, covered that whole thing up, and we had about a half-inch standoff in the insulation on that thing. When you run it in, in one atmosphere and you shut it off, it acts like a chimney. The air heats up between the insulation and the, and the hot surface. It goes out the top, it draws cold air in. It goes out the top, it draws more cold air in, so it cools, cools it off. So the heat never did soak out into the valves and get the valves too hot. When you put it in a vacuum, there's no place for that heat to go. And so all of that heat that was in the gas generator and all of the catalyst and all of that soaked back out through the structure and through the tubes back up to the valves and got the valves up to the uh, temperature at which hydrazine will uh, detonate. And it did. It's so simple. It's so easy to understand after you know about it. But to think about it, I remember sitting around there one night until 8, 9 o'clock with all of my troops. Uh, discussing the pros and cons of a, an altitude facility. Do we have to have it? Do we have to direct the contractor to, a, to put one in? And we could not come up with a good reason to put an altitude test in the program, so we didn't put it in there. Fortunately, we had a, had a just like on Ohms with the helium bottle falling out, we had a backup because some of the people wasn't confident in flying a vehicle without that test and we found something that we didn't, you know, didn't that's, expect. That's the message that Henry's giving you on testing is the same message that J.R. Thompson gave you on testing on the main engine. <clears throat> and in contrast, we didn't really do that type of testing on the solid rocket booster, the fare we had, and on the foam. And that's the difference. We really tested. When we saw a problem, we tested it. And, uh, you know, we're fortunately, we, were, we came out very fortunately that we did do it. Uh, Another thing with, with the uh, development of the APU, you know, we flew those things on airplanes all the time in case they lost main, main engine uh, or fighter aircraft and, and uh, uh, some of the other uh, airplanes, including a supersonic uh, plane uh, that we had. Uh, it had APUs in there in case they lost the engine power to provide hydraulics to be able to land the vehicle. Uh, and that's where I got a lot of the flack because the uh, Aerospace uh, Safety Committee told me that those systems never did work because they're called auxiliary power units that never worked when you needed them. Uh, but, but they had those systems, and, and, and they were good systems. But when we try to use that same kind of design on the shuttle, the oil wouldn't go back to the uh, sump in the absence of gravity. You know, you sling it out and it just coats the walls. It won't go on, on, uh, on an automobile, you know, you put an oil pan down the bottom, you put a pump right in the bottom, put a little filter in there, pump the wall out, and pump it through the engine, you use it over and over and over. But when you have no bottom, you have no place for that oil to, uh, to go. So we had to come up with a technique of where we could use the gears as oil pumps. And we came up with very, very close tolerances between the gear and the, and the case, and let the gear sling the oil out or, or pump the oil out into a cavity and pipe it off to where we had a, had a sump to where we could pick the oil up with an oil pump and pump it back, back through the system. 
and, and you know, you, we had some problems with some hydrazine getting in there and gelling at one time, and uh, Fram came out with this deal where you can pay me now or you can pay me later kind of thing because they accused us of not changing the oil filter. Uh, hydraulics was, was mostly off the shelf at the time. The pump and, and that stuff. We did go to titanium propellant lines or hydraulic lines. We did go to a, a developed a, a special fitting to switch, uh, put titanium lines together that turned out to be very, very good. <coughs> Uh, we did have to add an, a water boiler to cool the hydraulic fluid because uh, on airplanes you put a little radiator in there and use the atmosphere to cool it, but uh, that didn't work on uh, in space, so we had to put a water boiler. The first one they came up with was a bucket, and they had a coil of tubes in that bucket with a pipe that went out with some baffles in there to keep the liquid from going out. But there again, they did not understand the absence of gravity. When in zero G and you put heat in that water, it just pushes the water out away from the, uh, from the tube and all the water go out the exhaust pipe and, and uh, you'd have nothing but uh, gas in the, in the tank. So we had to change that design and go into what we call a water spray boiler to uh, uh, spray the, uh, pulse the uh, water in there as a, as a spray is more efficient but uh, uh, complicated that, uh, that system very much. Uh, and it used to freeze up. Still does. Yeah. Still does. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very difficult to handle uh, uh, water in a, in a vacuum. You know, uh, getting back to the RCS one moment, you know, first rain we had down there at the Cape, the uh, RCS just filled up with water, and they wanted to... Uh, launch a system and, and uh, assuming that the water would uh, boil out when they, uh, they started going uphill. But no, what happens, you put water in a vacuum, about 60 percent of it will go to a gas and 30 percent of it will freeze. When it, when it freezes then it's a solid, you can't get it out, it just has to sublime which takes weeks and, and months. Now trying to get a, uh, a water boiler, we had valves in there that would, would supposed to uh, open and close when the pressure built up. <clears throat> well, when you get past that valve, when the valve would open up, that steam would instantly uh, uh, freeze on the, on the outside and it keeps growing back. Finally, the valve would be uh, stopped up and uh, you'd have to build the pressure up way high and it'd blow the uh, ice out. The pressure would come back down and start working again. But, uh, uh, we have, so we went to an orifice. Now, try and size that orifice of the right size where it uh, uh, maintains a little pressure in there, and you've got a variable load on the system, and you're putting variable energy into it. Uh, that's difficult to design that, too. So the water boiler still freezes. We still have a freezing problem on it. It's, it's not an easy solution to it. Uh, questions? Lose that water? Does that does the, escape into the, the water? Yeah, we, we just uh, just dump it overboard. It goes okay. through. It, we we got a a whole bunch of tubes going through this water, and we spray the water in in a spray, and it makes one pass through those tubes, and then it goes out the uh, out the exhaust. Uh, we didn't try to, you know, if you if you wanted to come up with some kind of regenerative system where you would uh, use the water over and over and over, then you've got to go through some kind of system to cool the water or you have to carry too much water aboard. Well, if you want to cool the water, the only way you really got to cool it is by using more water or, or sublimating some of that, that water. You can't just, in a, in a vacuum, you can't just put it out on, on a surface someplace and, and, uh, and, you know, I guess the temperature varies uh, maybe Henry, could you say a word Four. about the uh, flight control hydraulics lab with the test we ran in? Uh, Fickle? Yeah, with the, uh, with the uh, hydraulic systems. The hydraulic system was probably one of the most thoroughly tested uh, systems that we, uh, we had as far as mechanical systems was concerned. Uh, we built a whole hydraulic system integrated with the hydro uh, avionics, and we had, uh, had it designed so you could put loads on it, react the loads, 
uh, and you could program in what you thought was typical missions where you could uh, could vary everything. The only difference is instead of driving the uh, uh, hydraulic pumps with APUs, we drove the hydraulic pumps with electric uh, electric motors because we had ground-based uh, uh, electric motors to drive them. Uh, the very first test, and one of the things we ground ruled out was use of flex hoses, bellows, simply because they at that time were notorious for fatiguing and breaking and, and not, not working very good. So we put uh, trombone tubes in, you know, take a long tube and bring it back this, this way and tie it in. And now as the actuator moved, you know, it could, uh, could move and, and uh, you had enough spring or enough give in those tubes. On the very first time they fired that thing up, standing up there in the control room looking at it, and those trombone tubes just vanished. They'd be there and then all at once you wouldn't see them. <laughs> and I mean, you couldn't see them. You're standing up there in the control room looking and there's no tubes in there. They were show, shaking so bad that you couldn't see them. So we, we went through a big effort to uh, figure out ways to damp those things and, and, and isolate them so that uh, they didn't uh, vibrate. We also had a hydraulic leak where we nibbled the small rooms and, and lost Oh, we, uh, we had a major failure. We went to, uh, it was a hard, hard sell to convince the people to go to a, a single actuator, from dual tandem to single actuator. Well, no more than we got our first single actuator built, then uh, uh, the, the initial design had too much slack in a tube that went from one side to the other side because you had to have an expansion joint in there and we had no ring in there. And uh, they had too much slack in there and uh, it blew one of the O-rings out. Well, of course, when you blew an O-ring out, you lost all the hydraulics, not only from that system, but all three systems, because when it was downstream of, of the switching valves, and when one system ran out of fluid, it'd switch over to the other one, it'd run out of fluid. And uh, had we not had a very, very strong guy in the, in the program office at that time that never gave up on anything, that would have probably finished us off as far as uh, single actuators are concerned, but um, but uh, we were able to convince the program that it would tighten the tolerance up on it, paid very close attention to the uh, tolerance on it, that that could not, could not happen, and it has not happened again. Uh, now the question. Yes? You talked a little bit before about uh, you know, maybe substituting an electromechanical system for hydraulic. Would there be any other changes you make in the design if you had to go back and do it again? Uh, oh, if I had to do it, uh, do it again, I definitely would go with with electromechanical systems. Now that takes on many varieties. You know, you could have uh, small electric motors driving a hydraulic system right at the unit. You know, like you put electric motor on an on actuator. And that electric motor drive a small hydraulic pump that would uh, would move the actuator if you did not have confidence in uh, uh, <clears throat> worm gears and, and uh, uh, screw jacks and those kind of things to provide the uh, uh, mechanical force, power hinges and things like that. But there is no absolutely no no question in my mind that one of the safest things you could do for the uh, uh, arbiter right now would be to replace the uh, uh, hydraulic system, the APUs in the hydraulic system, with electrical system. We we have the uh, we have the motor technology. We have the uh, I think the gear and the, and the uh, uh, ball screw uh, technology to be able to uh, do that. I think we could do it uh, uh, cheap. I think it would really change the. Uh, I uh, it would also change the operational cost. It would it would uh, reduce the operational cost immensely. It would move the CG further forward on the vehicle, so you probably could take out a little bit more of the uh, uh, ballast that we usually fly in the front end. I guess we're still flying it. We always did. Yeah. Uh, I've got another question. Yeah. I was wondering, um, you talked earlier, and you, kind of, you had it on the slide, you really talk about it, how you were shifting weight between budgets, you know, when it came to, like, the, the controls people versus the, the hydraulics people and the APUs. 
I was wondering if you just expand on that of, of how in an actual development program it goes back and forth. I mean, is it is it usually come down from high? You're going to do this and you're going to do that, or is it they, usually it, they let you kind of work it out between the two groups? Or the, what? The, the control people have no weight budget. <laughs> right. I mean, their budget is is, is the uh, electrons that flow back and forth and and and, and the requirements. So. What they do is they start out with a requirement that they would like to have. And it's usually two, three, four times what they absolutely have to have. And then you have to sit down and start negotiating with them and explaining to them what it's costing. And often it gets down to the fact that the vehicle won't fly. I mean, it, it just flat won't fly. And when they're convinced then that it can't fly, then they're willing to concede that they can get by with a little more. And so it still won't fly, so they can get by with a little bit uh, little bit more. And that's kind of the way you get it down. Normally what you have is you start off a project. You have what they call work breakdown structure. Maybe the term work breakdown structure. So that's what you do is you have a work breakdown structure, and you parcel that work breakdown structure out to your subsystem managers. Now, there was an issue in the shuttle and the Apollo program since I was the project manager. You give the subsystem managers the requirements and the authority technically, but you do not give them the authority. You tell them what their constraint is for dollars. You give them the weight, you give them the weight bogies or the weight requirements, the functional requirements, performance requirements, the schedule requirements, but you keep the dollars. Now, that's been a very long argument. Do you allow the subsystem managers to have, actually have control over the dollars. We decided not to. That was a very, very big argument of whether you should let the other people have the, the dollars. I kept the dollars. So uh, they had to come to me if they wanted to make a, a big change outside their work breakdown structure. Uh, and Because I had the problem of trading off the dollars between the propulsion system and the, and the structure system or the uh, aer aerodynamic system. And you can argue that was the right or wrong thing to do, but that's that's how we did it. And I'm not sure aircraft companies like Boeing now or, or or Lockheed Martin how they do it, but they all start off with a work breakdown structure of some type. Yes. At that stage, do you also give them target weights? You give them target weights also, yeah. You, you, yeah, you give them target weights and negotiated target weights and and our negotiated schedules. And they they develop the performance. Basically, you can target weights from the preliminary designs that you've done to look at the concept that you're looking at to make sure that it's feasible. And when it looks like it's a feasible design, then you break up the weights and you give all of the subsystem people their, their target weights to stay within, of which almost immediately the weights start growing. Well, that, that's right. It, it, when you're a project manager like I was, it, it's career limiting. First thing is, first thing is your weight starts to start to go up. The next thing is you start to have schedule slips because your technology problems, you're, you're finding technology problems, and then the cost starts to grow up, go up. So you're really, you're really sort of, uh, you know, you come to it with a lot of career limiting uh, problems uh, in, in project management. So, uh, but you have to have good people working for you. I think, Henry, the one, another interesting thing you might talk about is we've had, they've seen Bass Red talk about the aerodynamics. They're going to have Phil Haddis talk about the guidance navigation control. You might give them your perspective with a hydraulic system of tying those systems together. You mentioned it a little bit, but it was, uh, it's probably a little bit more, it's probably a little bit harder than, uh, than you think. Uh, <clears throat> and, and putting the requirements on the hydraulic system. I probably spent uh, uh, more time, personal time, dealing with the uh, avionics people, the guidance people, and the aero people than I did working with the, uh, with the uh, uh, subsystem uh, designs early on. Just trying to get some reasonableness in the requirements. <clears throat> trying to get the size of the Ohm's engines down, trying to get the size of the RCS down, trying to get the pulse width a little bit wider. On the hydraulics, that was a major, major issue because those were really big weight weight items. On the ohms and RCS, it, it was not a big weight impact. It was a performance uh, uh, impact of how much propellant you had to carry, carry on board. But on the hydraulics, on the design of that system, that was a very how fast you had to move one of those uh, flaps on that thing was a big, 
big issue. And I spent lots of time going over them, looking at their data, looking at what they were coming up with, looking at their, their what ifs, trying to get their uh, what ifs. Uh, that's, that's what drives the systems is what if this happens or what if that well, happens. The problem I remember we had is the uh, gimbal rate of the, of the main engines, uh, the, the requirement they put on the gimbal rate. That, uh, that that was a compounded problem too, because you were kind of dealing between uh, centers. between yeah. centers. But uh, but yeah, the gimbal weight and 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 and, and g the need for a gimbal system on the uh, solid rocket motors. You know, if I had my day in court, we would take the gimbal system off of the uh, solid rocket boosters, and we would fix those. That would save six or seven or eight tons of weight back there if you take that uh, system out it would make the solid rocket boosters much more reliable because they, they got those great big old boots in there and those big springs, they horse those things back and forth with huge actuators on, on them. And, and the only reason we could not eliminate the gimbal system on the SRBs is that we had one SRB that burned out with the max burn time and the other one on the other side burned out with minimum burn time and we lost the top engine on the uh, SSME at the, on the same flight. Now you know the probability of that happening is once in a billion but yet that is what drives the requirement for the having gimbal system. Oh we'd have to gimbal the main engines another two degrees uh, to make that to make that work. But that is what drove the design, that requirement drove the design that we have on the solid rocket motors. So if I can leave you with one message, is understand your requirements extremely well and understand the impact that that requirement is having on your system and, and on the flyability of the vehicle. Give me another one. Well, thinking, I'll give you one. Uh, I told you that Henry had a lot of innovative design. Now, talk a little bit more about the RCS. I thought you were going to mention that before when they got water and, oh. uh, and how you solved that problem. This is Henry, Henry Pohl's solution to a very complex problem on the RCS system. On the pad. The, uh, the, uh, when we got the RCS engines filled up with water, uh, we needed to come up with a design to keep the water out of the engines in case of rain because it always rains at the Cape. So uh, that uh, requirement fell on the contractor to design a system to uh, keep water from getting in the RCS engines. They came up with a plug that went in the throat with another big seal to go around those big scarf nozzles out there with no ring on that and that was all tied together with cables and they stuck a big pole upside the vehicle and just before liftoff they were going to pop that pole over and jerk all of that stuff out and they were going to jerk it out fast enough so that those big things would not fall down and hit the tile knock all the tile off. Well that looked kind of complex and complicated for me. So I went down to, uh, uh, we had a grocery store across the street down there then by the name of uh, Wine Gardens and I went down to Wine Gardens and I got a roll of what uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, wrapping paper that you use uh, to wrap meats in that's got wax on one side and and paper on the other other side. I call it butcher paper. But butcher paper is actually a little bit uh, uh, different. This is actually free. If you go down and buy some, it's freezer paper. But uh, I bought a roll of that and, and I I got it back up into the meeting by the time it was over and I said this is the way to fix it and then started tearing off sheets out and passing it around to the managers look at we can glue that on on the surface with the wax side out and uh, glue it on with our RTV and then when you lift it off you know it would come off it was light it wouldn't hurt the tile if it impacted anything it wasn't going to hurt anything if it didn't come off when you are uh, fired the RCS you blow it off or burn it off and that's what that's what we did and we flew that on all of the uh, <laughs> all of the well, you know, there's... It, it sounds funny, but it's true. You look at the orbiter sitting on the pad, and all the RCS jets are covered up with paper. <laughs> but after after I left, they changed that. Yeah, they changed, they changed from from butcher paper to a, a special 
paper developed special for that purpose. It's made out of Teflon. So that is... <laughs> you got to tell them once, one more story about the uh, SSME on the launch pad and the hydrogen. Uh, oh, uh, uh, this was JR's when, period. When we uh, did the first uh, uh, firing on the on the pad, just a test firing on the pad on on the launch pad to make sure that everything worked right, uh, we blew the back end out of the shuttle. When those uh, main engines light off, each one of those engines dump out about 125 pounds of hydrogen before they it ignites. That hydrogen is coal. It's fairly dense in, in the liquid form. It's four and a half pounds per cubic foot or something. By that time, it's a little bit lighter. It goes down in, in the uh, flame pit, mixes with a lot of air in there, and then the flame hits it, it detonates, and it blew the back end out of the, uh, and blew the back end out of the, out of the vehicle. So we needed a quick fix, because we had launch that thing three, four days. Uh, I looked at the problem. I said, we'll just put Roman candles under it. You put a bunch of Roman candles under there that fire those uh, balls out across there and as the hydrogen comes out that'll ignite the hydrogen, it'll burn, it won't accumulate down the pit. And that's what we did. Those sparklers you see uh, coming on uh, before the main engines light off, that's uh, my uh, Roman candles. Uh, as long as we're talking about uh, blowing the Back into the order, uh, maybe you talk about the pressure wave as well. The, the pressure wave that came back. Yeah, the, and, the, and the water suppression. Oh, uh, <laughs> we had a, we had another problem. It was more of an acoustical problem from the from the pressure waves coming back up under the orbiter, and, and we needed uh, some kind of a, a solution to do that. And back while I was uh, in Huntsville as a test engineer in the test lab there in Huntsville, we blew the uh, windows out seven miles away when we started firing the uh, Saturn V vehicle. So we spent a lot of time on water suppression techniques to, uh, I mean, uh, sound suppression techniques to uh, reduce the uh, uh, pressure effect. And one of the things we came up with, our water was very good at dam damming out. So when we had that problem down at the Cape, what we did is put those sausages, uh, the hammocks across down there and fill them with water to uh, damp out the uh, pressure wave that came back up to the back of the back of the vehicle, so that's not a one of them. Essentially, like big water balloons. Uh, we call them sausage. You know, it's just a, a fabric uh, across the bottom, filled it up with water, strong enough to hold hold the water up, and then that damped the uh, sound sound waves, the shock waves that came back up to the uh, vehicle. Uh, again, just remember that it's not natural <laughs> for earthbound humans to think in terms of the absence of gravity and the absence of pressure. I cannot stress that too much. The, the, you know, you, you take a pot of water and you put it on a stove, it gets hot on top. You put it on a stove in zero G, it don't get hot on top. It just more pushes all the water out. Uh, heat transfer. You, you don't realize how much heat is transferred out through the uh, through the atmosphere. You have no atmosphere, you don't get any of the heat heat transfer out. The other thing to remember is that there is absolutely no substitute for a very good, very well thought out test program. It is not easy to test in the absence of gravity. It is not easy to test in the absence of pressure when you're reducing large quantities of gas or chemicals. But that is very, very important. And that is the one thing that really separates a space program from anything that we do here on, on Earth, is that uh, you have no atmosphere and you have no gravity to, uh, to help you in your design. Yet all of our thought process is based on having gravity and having an atmosphere. <clears throat> in some of the uh, designs of, of various experiments that I've worked with on space lab flights and other flights, uh, 
numerous failures, and, and over half of the equipment that failed, this is stuff generally that we use inside the shuttle, it was because of thermal problems, that they would overheat just because people didn't get the calculations right. You have no convection, um, and, and getting the thermal uh, design to work is, uh, is just really difficult. Uh, convection is one of the major problems that's overlooked because when you when you when you put heat in one place on the ground, it goes up. You take gravity away, it will not go up, and uh, that changes the whole complex, the thermal thermal matrix. Well, and then you know Henry talked a little bit about the screen system that was developed for the Ohms and RCS tanks, but uh, you know I. I, I, I just to make sure that you, you appreciate the complexity of this, you know, you get a liquid, you've probably seen pictures of astronauts playing with food and, and liquids. You blow these big, you know, liquid bubbles and they just sort of float there. Well, you know, the liquid does the same thing inside a fuel tank. And, and when you push the button to make, you want your engine to turn on, you know, how do you get the, the fuel to, uh, to flow into the engine? And, and, as Henry said, in the old days, you, you had a kind of a diaphragm. Everything it was in, it was in a uh, like a little balloon, and you would pressurize the outside of the balloon, and that would force the fuel out. But but that balloon uh, would get eaten away. I mean, remember that that was a system that was only used for one flight. Now we've got a system that has to be reusable. And if you didn't want to replace those uh, those diaphragms or balloons every flight, you needed something that. It's a different system. That's where they came up with the idea of the screens, which would have surface tension, so enough of the propellant would stick to the screen, and then you would get the helium on the other side that would push it out out of the screen. And and um, with the ohms, of course, once once you got the system started, then of course you're you're producing an acceleration, and it's always in the same direction. So, so that the Ohms tanks are designed so that they only have to feed enough propellant through the screening system to get the engine started, and then everything is, I won't call it gravity fed, but it's fed by the accelerations. About a, when both engines are burning, it's about a tenth of a G. But the RCS, that can push you any direction, you know, and, and so you, uh, you have to have a system which, which will continuously feed uh, no matter which direction your acceleration vector is, it, 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 it's a really complex and and, and the and the uh, uh, design is based strictly on surface tension. Why are there so many uh, RCS engines? For example, on the nose, there are there are what, sixteen. What? Yeah, is, is that for redundancy or? or uh... Uh, part of it's for redundancy. Part of it's make sure that you've got one to cover every every direction. We got three. I guess we got six going down in front. Now, we need two of those for certain certain maneuvers. So you can can lose four of them. And we got, what is it, four going out. Uh, you can lo lose one on either, either side. Uh, yeah, and, and remember, you, you, need, you need a coupled pair. You, you would like to, to be able to do a pure rotation. If you just fire one one engine in the aft, you're you're going to get a rotation, but you'll also get a translation. So you need coupled pairs, and then for redundancy, we have three sets. So if you add up the you know the x-axis, the y-axis, the z-axis, so you've got to be able to translate in three axes. You've got to be able to rotate about three axis axes, and then you need dual redundancy for each of those axes. You add it up, and you end up with uh, with 38 primary jets. And then on top of that, those are 850-pound jets. They use a lot of propellant. When you're when you're in orbit, generally, and all you worry about is is your attitude, and you're not you're not doing a propulsive burn for rendezvous or anything. We shut down the primary RCS system, and we just use six little 25-pound vernier thrusters, all of which are pointed down. So so you do get uh, when, when you use those for attitude control, they do give you a little bit of, of propulsive in, impulse as well. 
but it's a small enough thrust that it doesn't change your orbit by very much. Uh, let, let me tell you another another story about the uh, absence of uh, about the uh, expulsion devices on the uh, on the shuttle. Back in my young days, I grew up in the country, and we had a Ford tractor. <clears throat> Ford tractor had a screen in the fuel tank, and it stood up about that tall, and they had a little standpipe in there, and the valve was such that when you got uh, uh, down, you could set the valve one way, and it'd leave about a gallon of fuel in the tank, you turn it the other way then, and uh, it would use that gallon of fuel out, kind of like a gas gauge on a Volkswagen, on the earlier Volkswagen. Well, what happened is that I had that out one day, and it had a hole, tenth of an inch diameter hole punched in that screen about halfway up on the screen. I said, well, that screen's not doing any good. It's got a hole in it. So I got me a ball of sorter, and I stopped up that screen. You know, after that, that tractor, you could have it set where the gallon fuel was supposed to remain in the tank, and when it quit, it was empty. You switch it over, and it still wouldn't run. You couldn't get home. You had to walk home. Well, it turned out that they had put that hole in there as a vacuum breaker to va break the vacuum on it, and that is the way that the shuttle system works. The uh, screens that we have in there is fine enough so that uh, the surface tension across those small pores is strong enough so they will keep the air from punching through unless you put a big big hole in them. So we had to make sure, and, and uh, that was another one of the things that convinced me that we could design uh, a screen system that would work in the absence of gravity. Goes back to a Ford Goes all the way back to 1947 on a Ford tractor. Henry, uh, okay, well, we've come to the end, so let's uh, let's thank Henry for. Uh,